Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Apostle T.V. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you to Sunday Worship in the Word. Certainly glad that you're here. I'm certainly glad to be here. Glad that we're here together. Listen, let's make sure that, um, you know, we really, really have a good understanding of what we're here to do today. You know, part of what we do in, in this Word is that, you know, we're refueling. We're getting some uh, some some instruction that God wants to give us to for the alteration and the absolute complete change of our lives. And that's what we're here to do, you know, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that only comes by the washing of the word. And that's the word of God. So we just thank God for what he's doing right now. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to get directly into the word after that. And we're going to see what the spirit of the Lord has to say. Listen, don't hesitate to press that share button, tag your friends, let them know we are here. The revelation train is here. And that what we are offering today is designed to be absolutely life-changing. And I hope that you're here for something that's going to be life-changing for you. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get directly to the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you right now for this gathering of your people. God, no matter where they are, no matter you know what they're doing, we just thank you right now that you are allowing us this moment of attention, that we're able to hear your word, so that we will be able to do your word, to be able to manifest all that you have placed in us, to show the world. We bless you right now for everything that you've intended to do and for what you're going to bring to pass. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, listen, we're going to be looking in the book of Malachi today, Malachi chapter 1, and we're just going to read verses 6 through 8. Malachi chapter 1 is three verses. Going to be real quick, but I think that there's something really powerful in there for God's people. This deals with the priesthood. But, you know, as believers, we are called royal priests. We are, we are part of the priesthood. You know, we're not just grafted in as citizens of the kingdom, which we are, but we also now are grafted in into a nation of priests that every single believer is an, a serving, worshiping priest before the Lord. Let's take a look at the word in Malachi chapter number one, and this is going to be verses six to eight, and I'm going to be reading out of the ESV version. Here's what it reads. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am your father, where is my honor? And if I am master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Verse number eight, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. Now, you know, take a look at this. You know, the Lord starts talking about, he begins to deal uh, with the children of Israel through Malachi. And, you know, there is a great deal of uh, indifference that's really going on. This is a group of people that are, that are really, really lukewarm. They're continuing worship. You know, everything on the outside may look the same. And there's some things that are going on here that are so important, uh, you know, and you begin to see the hand of God here because you can see that they're not aware of what's going on. You know, as they're looking, you know, when, when you, can you imagine in, in that heavenly scene where the person comes and says, you know, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do these mighty works in your name? And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I, we are not in relationship. Now, God is the one who absolutely knows what's going on. But the interesting thing is the mindset of the people, you know, as they, you know, make their cases, they plead before the Lord and say, wait a minute. Didn't we do these things in your name? They were completely unaware of the frayed or, or, or non-existent relationship that they were in with God at that time. They were assuming that it was about works and that God was not peering into their most their deepest and, and most hidden thoughts. But, you know, when you begin to look at this, you know, through Malachi, God is beginning to ask the priest, listen, why do you show me so much disrespect? Why do you show me so little respect? Why do you show such great indifference to me, to your work, to what I've called you to do? And I'm watching that in your sacrifices. You know, you call me father. You call me all these great titles. You know, before you come before me, there's this great obeisance that you do, this, this ritual that you do as if I'm a holy and, and, and a righteous God. And then you call me master, but you don't honor me as a master. You call me master, but you don't reverence me as if I was your master. And I'm watching that again in your sacrifices, not just what you're thinking, but it's manifesting itself in what you're doing. I'm checking out your worship. 
This is not about what's happening in the marketplace. This is not what's going on in the house. This is what's happening in the worship. Now, why doesn't he deal with the marketplace? Why doesn't he deal with the house? Well, everything in the marketplace and what's going on in the house is going to be tainted if the worship is off. As I operate with God, I'm also going to operate with people. Whether I know that or not, whether my if my worship isn't right, if it's lukewarm, if it's if it's insensitive, and if it's if it's a hiding worship that hides more than it exposes, then the reality is I'm going to operate that exact same way in my life. Jesus will come later and say, Why do you call me Lord? But you don't do what I say. You know, you know, one of the things that you've got to understand here is that as a son, sons oftentimes begin to check the father. They begin to look at the father and they begin to look at the things that they perceive the father is doing and decide in their own mind whether that father is really worthy of their worship, is really worthy of their respect and their admiration. And it manifests itself. You know, the Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so, though, you know, you may not say it to your father, your actions are going to say it. Though you may not ever speak it to your father, your actions are going to say it. Jesus comes and he says, well, here's the thing. A son is out of line, especially when a son thinks the only role they have is to determine the worthiness of the father. But a true son must also be worthy of the title of son. The, the onus is on the son to be the right kind of son. And listen, unfortunately, there are children who have fathers who are destitute of any natural affection. They're unable to be grateful. They're unable to appreciate what's going on. They're unable to appreciate the love that's actually been shown to them. So when you begin to see this, this illustration, this figure of a father here, this is a revelation of God's peculiar affection and his peculiar relationship that he has with Israel. You know, we look at God today and we see him as a father. It is not just like dad, you know, who gave me life. It's similar to that, but it's greater than that, you know, because it symbolizes a very unique relationship. You know, we get that in our in our in our parents. They're they're designed and they're supposed to show us this unique preferential love that God has for us. This, you know, I, I mean, listen, I'm going to be with you no matter what. You know, no matter what happens, I'm going to provide for you. Somehow, it seems like I knew before you even asked what you needed, and I had it there. You can always depend on me. I'm going to make sure it happens. This is what God is now saying. There, there's this peculiar. There's a special point that God is now downloaded to. Uh, Malachi. And part of this is that we've got to understand the tone, that, that, that the children of Israel are his. And that's what God was trying to tell them. That's what God is trying to tell the church now. You're mine. Listen, the reality is that, that you don't run me, you're not pushing me around, moving me around, manipulating me, motivating me like you think you are. No, no, no. Let, we got to get God. We, let, let's, let's make heaven happy. Listen, heaven don't have a problem. Heaven's already good. It's you that has a problem. It's you that's not good. So when you begin to look at this, that, that not only, you know, as a father, is this about, well, you know, daddy, did you throw the ball to me? Daddy, did you, did you make sure I was fed? Yeah, that's there too. But you can we can forget that a father this that has a divine claim over the child and that these these children that are that have a father in heaven you know this idea that like father in the name of Jesus God God in heaven the the, the prayer that we have we forget that we come under as children of God a special claim from God as as children of God we come under a special we, we have a special responsibility with God listen you know, when, when you understand this message, this message was for the priest. And listen, I don't think that the priest recognized that they were favorite children. They were children of God, but they were favorite children. And when you have favor, you are also bound to be a model child. There's a part of that when you're a special child, there, there, there are responsibilities you have as a special child. To whom much is given, much is required, right? There, there's an obligation that a servant has with their master, right? They, 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 there's certain things that they're bound to do. But, but in this case, not only is Israel a servant, but it's Israel is a son. So Israel has this help to do what they need to do based upon the personal affection that God has actually shown to them. That they're helped by the fact that, that he loves them. They're aided by the fact that he shines his light on them and that he's a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. They're aided by a past that they have with God that's not starting today, but it's been here that they can look back on their fathers and see the favor of God. And so the Lord begins to say, well, wait a minute. 
you you call me father, right? But but I don't see any reverence. But but he says, okay, so what if 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 I'm not your father, right? What if I am just your master because you call me Lord? You know, I hear you, you know, bowing down and giving me this obeisance like I'm a king. So he says, if I'm your master, if I'm really your master, then where's my fear? You know, I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about real fear. Where's my reverence? Where's my affection? Where's where, where all the things that, that come with this reverential fear that we know about? But what about the fear of punishment? Well, where's my fear? Like, I mean, as if, if it's not love, if it's not based upon affection, if it's not the help of affection, you still owe me reverence and fear because I am your master. Not just fear of making mistakes, but fear of punishment. Whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to fear that of, of, of my correction and chastisement? That you want to work and do everything you can not to receive it. Well, what about that? Listen, I mean, a son has affection. They're working hard to make sure that they're not chastised because of love, right? But if you don't have the love for me, if it's not love, I don't stop being a sovereign God. If it's not love, I don't stop being the master of the universe. So where is my fear? Listen, when you begin to see this master's claim, it also it, it is meant to be an illustration of the divine claim that God has on his people. There is a master's claim and a divine claim that work absolutely together. You, listen, in, in this relationship, there, there's, you know, in the servant relationship, there's a simple obligation. There's a simple uh, uh, duty that is actually exposed in the servant. A servant is actually bound to serve. That's exactly what they do. And as servants of God, we are bound to serve him. You know, so this applies to the priests, that they are servants of God. As priests, we are servants of God. We are bound to serve God, whether it is in our homes, whether it is in the church, whether it is in the street, whether it's in the marketplace. We're bound to serve God. And guess what? The Lord is asserting his right as a sovereign Lord to claim our service. God is coming and saying, wait a minute. I'm not begging you. I have a, I'm your sovereign Lord. Now, listen, I'm your father. If you want to shake off the idea that like, it's not personal like that. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to roll like that. Good. God comes and says, wait a minute. You see the crown? It's still here. The fact that this is, this is a father's crown, right? But if you don't want the shine of the father, check out the crown. It's still gleaming. I'm still master. I'm still Lord. You don't, whether you ever call me dad, whether you ever call me father, whether you ever call me poppy, whatever you think you can call me, whatever is affectionate, whatever is in your heart that makes you feel warm and fuzzy. If that warm and fuzzy feeling goes, don't forget, I'm still your boss. Listen, when it comes down to it, we are good, we are cool. But when it's all said and done, check out whose name is on the office out here, right? Check out whose name is on the marquee out front. So when I ask you to do something, when I command you to do something, the Lord is coming and saying, have you forgotten that I have a right to claim this service from you? You know, we, we get into these spots where the Lord called me and I ran and, you know, I know what the Lord said to do, but I wasn't feeling that. And I told him, uh-uh, not today. You want to make me do it. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. Some folks are twisted up like a pretzel right now because of that statement you made. He wants to make me do it. That's what Jonah thought. He wants to make me do it. Three days in the belly of a fish. There's some of us right now that are, that God wants to regurgitate so you can give, but he's not going to regurgitate you to, to dry land. He's going to regurgitate you right where you were supposed to be. Jonah didn't just get on dry land. Jonah was spit out on Nineveh, back on track. When he repented, God said, listen, let's get back to work, but back on track, back where you're supposed to be. Listen, with with, with the cherished reverence and fear. But but listen, if that, that that's the service that the priests were meant to offer. They were failing to render reverence and fear. They were, their lives exposed who they really were. Not their rituals, though. The rituals didn't show anything. You couldn't tell by Sunday morning. You couldn't tell by that moment when they had their garments on. You couldn't tell when they were in the sanctuary. But it was in the days, you know, and it was around the sanctuary, and it was in the heart that was in the midst of the rituals that God was saying, no way. No way. I, I, I'm not feeling this. Listen, you know what? God claims his servants for him. And these are his servants. And he says, well, listen, you know, you, you know, why do you offer me? Why, why are you doing this? And he says, they said, well, what are you talking about? He said, by offering polluted food upon my altar. He says, I know you don't reverence me. I know you don't have fear for me by the sacrifices that you're giving. I see what you're offering up. He says, but you say, how have we polluted you? And he says, by saying the Lord's table may be desp despised. Now, 
the priests were presided over the offering, right? They presided over the sacrifice. They presided over the gifts. The, the worship was really the people's gift to God, right? This is what we're giving. And, you know, it, it, is, it is worship that comes from them. It is admiration that comes from them. Even though God now begins to illustrate who he is, he begins to show himself, you know, bigger than life. He shows himself bigger than people, right? So he shows himself as absolutely worthy of worship. Just the glimpse that they have of him is huge, you know, in, 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 in line with the idea that there's no human that can do what he's done. There's no person that can operate like he operates. There's no one can speak from the heavens and what he speaks comes to pass. None of those things can happen. So they have seen him as God. They have seen him as Lord. But somehow there's been a slide. The, the terminology has remained the same, but the affection has changed. The wording has remained the same, but the heart has been altered. And the Lord said, listen, I see it. Lord, you don't know what's in my heart. Well, check it out. I'm watching what's in your sacrifices. I'm checking out what's in your offering. I know what's going on based upon what you're offering me, what you're giving me. And as I'm looking at the offering, you know what I can tell? It's gotten crazy now. Any beast will do. Any beast, but the one that's blind, the one that's crippled, the one that's lame, the one, one that's dying on his feet as you are leading him in. They may die right before you even get to the priest. They, ha they have absolutely no, no other use. You can't use them. Right? You can't sell them. You can't eat them. The meat is so bad, you know, they, they can't be used for meat anymore. So guess what? They're good enough for God. I, I can't, I don't have any other use for it. Let me just throw the easiest thing in here. Let me let, let me make sure that, that I didn't think about this in any way whatsoever. Let me make sure this is not really it, God. Anything, anything that could serve no other purpose for me is good enough for God. Now, like I said, if I could use it, then I mean, God can't get it yet. Until I use it, because this is what he gave it to me. He gave it for he gave it to me so I could use it. If, it, if I mean, if it's precious, that can't be for God, because he's invisible. So he doesn't need anything precious. Preciousness doesn't mean anything to God, you know. And and so th they were in this slide, and the Lord says, "But you say, in what way have we despised your name?" Now you know Malachi is awesome because it has these questions. But one of the things that you got to understand is that tone is everything. And there is this huge sarcastic tone that you hear coming from God. But I need you to understand something. You know, that you know, you watch those movies and a person is able to actually mimic your voice and they speak in your voice and a person's kind of freaked out because they hear themselves. You know, when God is actually talking here, he's actually talking in their voice. He's talking in the voice of the priesthood. He's mimicking them. And so when you hear the tone, uh, when you hear the sarcasm, he's exposing the sarcasm that they have had in their worship. This is not something they would have uttered. This is a sarcasm and a tone that is completely unspoken. This is not something that they told their wives and their, their husbands. This is not something that they mentioned to their prayer partner. No, this is something that they've kept in their heart. You know, when they came into the priest, when they came into the, the, the t sent, uh, temple, they, they walked in in line. When they came into the temple, everything was pressed in, and neat. You know, when they, whoever was turned to the right, they, they turned to the right. Whoever was supposed to turn to the left, put your, put your right hand up, put your left hand up. They did whatever you were supposed to do. If there was a swinging of incense, they did it. You couldn't tell. But here's God now coming, and he comes with their tone. And he comes now with an accusation. It is accusatory tone. And that's exactly what, ha what what's happening here. They've refused to be reached. I want you to understand something. When the Lord deals with them here, he's dealing in a tone that is sarcastic by people who've heard it before. See, the reality is this is a conversation that they've had in their heart. Remember, these are his people. You know, when Malachi comes, Malachi comes when the time is right to manifest it. Malachi comes when they have refused to hear not only the other prophets that have come, but the God of the universe who has spoken directly to their hearts. And this conversation, the Lord said, listen, you didn't tell anybody this, right? Nobody around you knows. They think you still operate in, in this the divine holiness. You know, they think that you're still upright, but they don't know what's going on in your heart. And this is what God is actually exposing in their heart. You aren't even aware of the slide that you've taken. You aren't. Even, you said this in your heart, but you didn't know I was listening to your heart. You were saying this inside. You were sarcastic in all your worship. You couldn't wait to get up out of here. You know, you were just doing your duty. What time? What time is this thing over? I got I mean, I got to do my duty. I got to show my face up in there. But what time is this thing open? These crazy people. I'm not feeling like serving people. You know what I mean? All of these things. When you begin to look at this, the Lord says 
you are not even aware of what's going on. This is happening now by degrees, piece by piece. Slowly but surely, your reverence is wearing off. Slowly but surely, your love of God is beginning to wax cold. Slowly but surely, your fellowship with people, you're there, but you get in and get out. You don't have a duty. You know, the word was just for you to get what you needed right now, but it was not to spur you on to work. It was never to spur you on to move the, the ball forward. You are not trying to push the goalposts of the kingdom in any way just to get certain sensual things met the feeling that you are looking for i came to get a feeling i didn't really come to get jesus and the offense here is that jesus is saying i see what's going on in the priesthood and we are simply carrying on right now business as usual. We've come through so much where God is just showing us himself like never before. He's exposing what's going on. We got it going on out here right now. I'm telling you, I mean, the virus after virus after virus, monkeypox, and you know, d different strains of COVID. We have stuff that's floating out here and we are missing the message and, and all the things that are meant to bring us back to reverence, all those things that are meant to bring us back to fear, to bring us back to understanding. We serve a sovereign God who created all this who can end it just like that. We're watching him end it just like that. There are people who left here and never came back, left and went home to be with the Lord just like that. And did it bring us to fear? Did it bring us to reverence? Did we look at the same God who says, don't fear him who can only kill the body, but fear him who can kill body and soul in heaven. Fear him. Would you, you mean bow down? No, you know what I'm talking about. You know, listen, the laws for the lawless. Listen, we, we we need this. We have to understand that there's a part of God that we have, that we're easy to push out, that, that the God part. Now, the, the buddy part we love, the friend part we love, the, the provider part we love, right? The, the, the way maker, the, the, the open door guy we love. And we forget. That he is a almighty God, he, he is a man of war, and that God is saying, wait a minute, so you just ran and didn't have any fear that what would happen if I caught you? You just said that and had no fear that I was around standing right there when you said it? You talked about my office that I gave you, the, the, the title that I gave you, and you despised it? You are an instrument of destroying the church? You are a gossiper? And here you are supposed to be a priest? And you have, I mean, like it doesn't even touch you anymore. You don't even feel it anymore. Listen, it's easy. And I want you to understand this is ministry. He's talking about ministry and where ministry is and how blind we can get to ministry because the buildings are there and we're growing and people are coming and they're patting us on the back and we don't realize it's just business as usual. I'm not feeling you, but I've learned how to look and turn my head to the side like I'm listening to you, but I'm not really feeling you. I've learned how to say, I'm going to pray for you and then get in the car and put on my music and I ain't praying for you. I'm not even thinking about it. That's just what I'm supposed to say. That's priest talk. And the Lord was saying, listen, I'm tired of priest talk. I want priests. I don't want priests who can just act like priests or look like priests. I want people who think like priests. And listen, I want you to understand something. That's the mind that God is going to. The depth here, the, the, the putting the ax to the root of the tree is about our thinking. The Lord is saying, listen, I'm tired of this thinking, thinking. I, I can get anybody to do the ritual. I can get anybody to do the chant. It, that, that's, not, that's not hard. I can get anybody to, to sing. We got singers out there left and right. But I want somebody who's got a heart for me. And, you know, that, that's not operating in what is mechanical indifference. That's what it, I don't care about it, but I'm going to do it. That's my job. I, don't, I mean, listen, I, I want you to understand something. The Lord says, you and, we're not supposed to have that kind of relationship. And, but, but there's an obedience that I require that even if you're a servant, if I'm saying to you, come boldly before the throne. How, how can you come here without boldness? Like when I, when I said to you, come on in here with gladness, how can you come in here and not have gladness? Listen, you know what the message was here for Israel? The Lord said, listen, I want you to think about your worship again. I want you to just think about it. And that's the message for the children of God today. Listen, I want you to think about it. I want you to carefully think about what you're doing. When you decide to go to church, you know, today, 
Don't you think about this? Like, what are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? Because when you wake up and thank you, Jesus. I mean, like, is it? Are you serious? Like, is it really thank you, Jesus, or is that like before? Listen, I made a pact with myself before I put my feet on the ground. I'm gonna thank Jesus, and like before you know, it, you're like, thank you, Jesus, and you're not even thinking about it anymore. And the Lord says, get back to it. I want you thinking about it. You're saying the stuff. I got you. You you got the words right, but there's no Jesus in it. Just the word is Jesus is in it. There's no God in it. There's no love in it. There's no reverence in it. But the words are there. The words are God. No, no I want the thought to get back in there. Your words are hollow. The words are empty. You know, why do you call me Lord? But you don't do what I say. You keep calling me Lord, though. You keep using the right words, but your lifestyle exposes that I'm not Lord to you. Your, your living is exposing that I'm not really God to you. If, if this were God, how could you not do it? If this were God, I mean, if I was really God, how could you snatch away from me? I mean, if I'm really God to you, how can you put your hand up and tell me, wait? If I'm, if I'm really God. And he says, listen, I want you to understand something. You're saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible. Listen, I want you to get this. And I really want you to get this. The, the priests were not grateful for their ministry. The priests had a ministry. And they had the burden of a ministry. Oh, oh the Lord has put this on my back. This is, this is tough. This is hard. You know what I mean? Listen, let me get, let me get to my sermon, though. Because he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. Oh, he'll be a fence around you. You know, he'll teach you to leap over a troop. Now, when I get back in my office, I'm depressed. Boy, you don't know. You don't know how hard it is to do what I do. Boy, I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. I told my friend, you want to get in the ministry? Boy, you better get you. It'd be easier for you to join the Taliban to get into the ministry. It'd be easier because these people are crazy. They whine and whine and whine about this great office that God had given them. They whine and whine and whine and miss this preferential treatment that God had given them. That this title that they didn't deserve. They did not deserve to be able to stand before God and worship. And yet he picked them to do it. And all they did was testify about how they ran from it. Testify about who would want this. I mean, they, they, they forgot who they were. They forgot they were slaves that God says, I took you out of Egypt and made you a priest. And you've gotten so used to it now that it's contemptible to you. That, that now, that you know, you start thinking you have to do the job. Well, what, I mean, what's the church going to do? We, we don't do it. If I don't do it, what's going to happen? Well, you forgot that it was God who gives us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. But when we stop desiring to do his good pleasure and the ministry becomes about me it becomes about my goal it becomes about what i wanted to do it, it becomes my aspiration it is now my moment it's a shark tank you know where i'm really just putting my product out there i want to make sure that somebody can can you know i'm just trying to get on i'm trying to go to that next level that's what it is america's got talent check me out this sunday because i'm gonna do some backflips and i'm gonna do some stuff that's gonna trip y'all out and y'all gonna be talking about this all throughout the week oh Oh, didn't you preach? But no changes, no transformation. Why? Because I'm just going through the motions. Preaching hard sermons, preaching deep word, and then depressed. Preaching all these things that are meant to be life-changing and, and motivating and having no motivation for yourself. Ministers committing suicide left and right. Ministers going out there having to, to you know, to, to doing all manner of things to, to keep their head above water as if that this isn't an honor. That they're, you know, running and, and trying to get away from the things of God and have not realizing that what you're running from are things you created for yourself. You're only running from the things that you could. Those weren't the things of God. You're not running from the things of God. You're running from the things of you. You're running from the little the thing that the little, the, the little kingdom that we created. And, and that house that seems to keep crumbling that always needs repair. Listen, let me tell you something about the church of God. The, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. It can't beat against this house and put not one hole in it. And when you see holes in the house, it's only because it's a wall you built. And so that wall, God is saying, break that down. Break, that's meant to be broken down. The only way the enemy can get to it because it's meant to be broken down. God is tearing down things that we erected. God is not tearing down anything that he put up. There's nothing that he erected. God is saying, listen, that heart right there for ministry that you have, that's not the heart I gave you. I need, I need that torn down. That that attitude you have, the reason why you're not having any joy in your ministry, because you think it's yours. The reality is, it's mine that I gave to you. And when you understand that again, when you understand I could have picked anybody, you know how I many millions of people are on this planet and I picked you to be a mouthpiece, you with your record, with your background, 
with all the things you lack, you write. You really are not good with grammar. But I picked you, and I'm going to do something with you, and you're going to be the first person in your family to, to put verbs and nouns together correctly. Guess what? I'm blessing you. And listen, you didn't have the pedigree. There was nothing in your background that indicated. People are still shocked that I picked you. Have you forgotten the honor I placed upon you? And I know you have because of the honor you placed upon me. And so he says, listen, when you honor these, when you, when you do this, right? When you when you give me these blind uh, animals and sacrifices, when you give me these lame and these limping animals, like I, I can't, it's shocking that you know you have to pick the, the lamb up because both his legs are broken. He can't even walk and be led to the slaughter. You have to pick him up. And like you really see yourself picking them up. You see your garment soiled by all the things that he is oozing. And yet you actually gave that and said, this is for the Lord. God bless you. Lord God, you've been so good. Let me just wipe that off his face. Don't, don't look at that. Because, I, you know, looking at Leviticus and Deuteronomy, I know they're supposed to be without spot or blemish. I, I know they're supposed to be perfect, but God, you understand. You, you understand what I've been going through. Listen, I needed to sell those other three good lambs to be able to keep my car. But of course you gave me that car. So I know you would want me to do that. And since you own a cattle on a thousand hills. What do you care? Whether these lambs have their blind. I mean what do you, what does it matter to you right? I mean I, listen. One of them had a cut. Of course I thought I was going to cut them. And then I said no 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 no. no. Let, me, let me get at the God. The Lord said listen I'm watching you. He And he says isn't it evil? Like, I mean, are you understand? Like, are you not seeing this? That this is evil. Listen, I want you to really understand what God is talking about here, because this is about priests, right? And this is easy to begin to talk about the priesthood. This is easy to begin to deal with ministry. It's easy to get in the pulpit and begin to break people down. But you know what? Society is actually revealed in the faithfulness of its priests. It's the clergy. I want you to look at our world right now, and I want you to see the, the to check the temperature of the world, to really be able to understand the barometer that, that God has placed in the earth, to really be able to see where is the world? It's actually in the priest. The, 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 when you begin to look at this as like priests, like people, as priests go, so go the people. That's a real thing. That's a real saying. And when you begin to look at the clergy, they are the moral barometers. They are the spiritual barometers of the society. They check the atmosphere. And when the atmosphere is crazy, we're looking around saying, it's crazy out here. And the Lord said, I want you to understand where the craziness is, is, is emanating from. I want you to understand what's allowing some of these things to seep in. The priesthood has lost its savor. The, the, the priesthood, the, the atmosphere is being gauged. And the, there's a moral and, and there's, a, there, there's a, a social degeneracy that's coming out of this priesthood. And that's what's, what's happening there. And so when you begin to see the people going astray, the Lord said, well, it didn't start with the people. It starts with the leaders that I placed there. When they go astray, when, when the police the, the, the don't carry the sword in vain, when they go astray, when magistrates that I put there so you can have a live a quiet and peaceful life. Man, when they go astray, when the clergy is there to do a beautiful feet, that are supposed to bring this glad tidings, but only bring you bad news and just anger and fussing and, you know, their own agenda and, the, the, you know, the new plan for the, for the, for the add on to the building. When that's all we're just talking about, you know, maybe a, a plane, you know, who, you know, who knows? Or when, when all the, when that's the only thing that's there, what do you think happens with the mindset of the people? They are all about themselves. So it's not shocking with what we've come out of in the church that the people are all about money, that people are most depressed, not that, you know, people are breathing, you know, that they weren't supposed to be breathing and saying, you know, what I'm, I'm so upset with the church because, I mean, I gave all this money and they forgot, like, listen, you're breathing. God has kept you alive against your own will, against your own work. He somehow managed to keep you alive when you tried to kill yourself. And now that you don't have money, you begin to hear that it was all about the money. See, listen, that's what, that's what we've come out of. And God is now re changing the ship. He's moving us back to a place where we worship, where worship is pure, where we begin to think about what we're doing. When we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, we're really thinking about this name that's above every name that we can envision, knees bowing. And tongues confessing that he is Lord. We can see in that resistance of Satan that he's going to flee. There are people who are praying and then going and taking, you know, all kinds of pills, you know, for their depression. And I mean, listen, there's clinical depression out there. 
But I want you to understand that there are some people that are, that are in a self-imposed depression that are saying, let me pray and are never reaching heaven because there's no thought in the prayer. It's just rote. It's just the ritual. So when you begin to look at this, the Lord said, well, listen, why don't you give this to your governor? I, I want you to check this out because he's asking them, look at the gift. Listen, I want you to understand something. The government wouldn't accept this as a tax. The, the, the government, the, the, the guys over there who don't care about you or taxing you, who are not giving to you, they're taking from you. Do you understand that you wouldn't dare bring that to the governor? You wouldn't give that to the governor. As angry as you are about the public, as angry as you are about the tax collectors, when they come, here's how you treat them. But when I come, I get your leftovers. I get your pennies. When the government comes and say, give me this, or I'll take that, you wouldn't dare offer that to them. You know, when David had a, David said, listen, I'm not going to offer you anything that costs me nothing. A sacrifice costs us something. And, and it's only because we recognize what God has done for us. Listen, offering something that, I want you to think about this. Think about, your, think about a friend. You know, and I want you to think about offering this imperfect gift to a friend. I want you to think about, you know, a friend and it's their birthday or they've graduated or there's some occasion. And just go around your house and I want you to find something that you're really finished with. That you're about to throw out. Some, something that, you know, that you no longer have a taste for. You're not feeling it anymore. You're not going to wear it. It's got stains on it. It's got holes in it. You know, I mean, it's soiled all over the place. And, you know, the, the certain sleeves are ripped. Take that to the, to the birthday party and give that to your friend. Give that to a person you say you love. Give that to a person you say you care about. I mean, zero gift might be better than that gift because what that gift does is dishonors your friend. That, that, that gift exposes what you think about your friend. But let me tell you something, even greater than that, even greater than that, listen, this isn't God whining from heaven and saying, you know, I mean, you just didn't honor me. You didn't give me what I deserved or, you know, woe is me. No, this is God saying, you know why I'm coming? Because this morally degrades you. I'm looking at what this is doing to you. Listen, when your worship is off, God is not coming and saying, I'm not getting any worship. Stars are worshiping him. Planets and never. Listen, there are, I would imagine, cre creatures. You know, because the Bible talks about these beasts that are in heaven that have these crowns that are throwing their crowns. Listen, I would imagine that this life that we're looking for in space that, that we don't know about, they're worshiping God. Birds are worshiping the Lord. Nature, sun, th there are all kinds of, there's great worship out there. So it's not like God is like, I'm worship, worship deficient. You know, I'm coming to you because I'm deficient in my worship. And I'm not going to be good unless you start worshiping. No, the Lord is saying, do you see the decay that's happening in you? Do you see how this is seeping into your body? Your lack of worship doesn't poison God. It poisons you. Your lack of worship doesn't degrade God in any way. He's as awesome before you said it. If you don't say, God, you're wonderful, he's already wonderful, though. Like, if you don't say, God, you're awesome, do you realize his awesomeness is never determined by whether you got it, by whether you co-sign it, whether you agree with it? He's already awesome. The problem is that when he's awesome and I don't see it, I lose. I'm degraded. I miss what he's doing. God is awesome, but he's also showing and revealing his awesomeness. And I can't be awesome. Unless I behold his awesomeness. And when I behold his awesomeness, I desire to be awesome because I am designed to be the offspring of awesome. That's what is supposed to happen. That's a line from one of my son's uh, songs too, the offspring of awesome. I want you to begin to look at this. God is comparing himself and saying, well, listen, if I'm your friend, let, let me see what kind of gifts you bring me. I mean, like if I'm really your friend. What do you think would be acceptable for me? And listen, I want you to get this. This may sound like bad news. This may sound like a, you're a bunch of criticism. But I want you to understand something. This is a corrective action. This is something that was undercover. This was something that was in the heart. And God comes and says, let them know I, I've been listening to them. We, we, listen to what? Well, I didn't say anything. No, you, this is what your heart was saying. You, you, you were unhappy with being a minister. You were unhappy with the burden of, of your ministry. You were unhappy being a Christian born in this time. Unhappy with, you know, you have to struggle just like everybody else. Unhappy with the fact that, like, yeah, the economy is touching you just like it's touching everybody else. Unhappy with all those things. But listen, I want you to understand something. Society goes down when the priests go down. But I'm going to tell you something. Society can be recovered when the priests are recovered. 
Listen, this word was about a planned revival. Malachi is not a big mallet over the head. It, it is not a ball peen hammer straight to the dome. Now, this is not God coming and saying, yeah, I heard what you said. No, this is God coming and saying, yeah, I heard what you said. Let's fix that. Because I, I know the thoughts I think toward you. They're thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Yeah, I heard what you said. We're going to fix that so that you can actually say the right things and be blessed. This is God saying, I, I've got a, a window that I want to open up and pour out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive, but it can't be done based upon these rituals. It's got to be based upon obedience. Obedience is, is greater than sacrifice. And I want obedience to start from the root, from your heart. Get your heart back in this again. When you worship, don't think about the job. Think about me. Don't think about the groceries. Think about me. Because listen, if it's dependent on the, the job, what happens when the job's not there? No more worship. What happens when the food and the cupboard is bare? No more worship. When you can't get the gas. No more worship. If, if the worship is about, Lord, you made a way again, and it has nothing to do with the fact you're supposed to be dead in your grave and you're here talking about it. If we don't whittle it down to, I'm honored again to be called by you. Listen, let's cut this running talk out. Let's cut this whining talk out. You know, the, you, listen, we're not whining in hell. The, 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 what we deserve to be doing is cackling and whining and crying and moaning in hell. And yet God is saying, I put you here and trusted you with my people. And here you are smiting a rock in your heart. You know better than to hit it with your hand. So you think you can do it in your heart and I won't see it and I won't hear it. But I hear what's going on. And I want you to understand, there's a revival that, that God wants for his church. There's a revival that God wants for his people. But I want you to understand something. Revivals are hopeless. We've been trying to do it. We've been trying to do it because we thought that people needed a revival. And here's what God is saying. The revival cannot happen unless the first effect of the revival is upon the priest. I want you to understand something. Your family is not going to get it. Not because you go to school, you, because you go to church. Your family is not going to get it because you keep, you know, inviting them to hear your dynamic pastor. Your family is not going to get it because you danced around and, and did all the things that were personal for you. Wonderful. I'm not against it. Personal for you, but has no effect on them because your heart has to be back in it. Back in it. They, they've got it. You've got to begin to recognize. I'm an example. People are watching me. I owe God something, a life. Listen, I want you to do that today. I want you to really think about what you're offering. I want you to think about your sacrifices. I want you to think about what you've been holding back. You know, what, what the Lord has, has said to you, this is what I want. And yet you said, well, how about this? You've been negotiating with Almighty God on what he deserves. I want you to get back to this and realize there's a revival that's coming. There's a revival in your house. There's a revival in your finances. There's a revival in, in, in your marketplace. There's a revival of ideas. There's a revival in so many areas of your life. But God is coming and saying, get back to it because I'm only blessing the priests. I'm not blessing the stand-ins. I'm not blessing the temps. I'm not blessing the people who are just doing it right now. I'm not blessing the people that are blessing me because it's good. I'm looking for priests, people that understand that not only am I their father, but I'm also their master. And that they owe me reverence. They owe me fear. And that this praise that you give, God has a right to it. He has laid claim upon your worship. Listen, I want you to get that today. I want you to get that. God doesn't need, you know, he doesn't need what you think he needs. God wants your worship. He's seeking true worshipers. Let's get back. We, you know, when we give, let's really look at our gift again and say, God, I thank you. This is so small in comparison to what you've done for me. When we, you know, when we want to bless somebody, let's remember, you know, God, you gave me this money to pay their, you know, to, to bless them, to be able to pay for those groceries. Let me get excited about it again. You know, too many people that are doing nice things and they get back in the car and they're struggling like, uh, should I give it? I mean, man, should I pay that $50? I mean, I don't have $50. I mean, you know, I mean, if you get the $50 back, then it's like, oh, I see God. No, what about the fact that like, man, I've always wanted to be in a position where I could pay for somebody's groceries. And he moved upon my heart to give that $50, and I'm so glad about it. Remember, you remember those days? Let's get back to that again. Let's get back to now giving freely. Let's, give, let's get back to where God is actually saying, now this is the priesthood. The, those that worship me, who worship me in spirit and in truth. Not those who know my past, but those who know me now. 
and not his past, because God has no past. Your past. We're not worshiping him, a God of the past. We're worshiping our ever-present help in time of trouble. Listen, I hope you get this message today. I hope this resonates with you today. And I hope you're ready to rise up and move and understand you're a priest. But listen, when you clap your hands, I want you thinking about what you're clapping about. When you thank Jesus today and say, thank you, Jesus, for this word. I want you to really look and say, God, you're correcting me. You're, you're moving the ship in direction and you're promising me a revival. That means that things are about to come alive in your life. And I'm so excited about that happening for you. I'm so excited about those that have received this today, that are really ready to give, give back and to give God the reverence and the respect that he deserves. Look at your gifts. Look at what you're willing to give. Look at what you're holding back and examine yourself and see if this God who's been so generous with me, am I generous with him? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you once again for this word, for your people, for those that are gathered here right now. God, we just thank you that you are reviving us, that we can feel the washing of the, the, the water of the word upon our lives even now, that the changes that we need, the, the resurrections that we need in our lives are happening even as we are speaking, as we're coming together, as we're thinking again about this great honor that you've given us to be able to call us sons and daughters. We, we revere you and we reverence what you've spoken and god we just thank you right now that we are taking this baton and we're going to run with it and we're going to pass this enthusiasm and excitement about service to this next generation we will not pass them a burden but we'll pass them an honor to be called sons and daughters of the most high god lord we thank you for this day and for all those that are giving today, all those that are sacrificing today, God, we bless you for their, for their gifts. We thank you for their sacrifice. And we thank you even now that they're going to take this message and apply it to their lives and then live as priests out loud and proud. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I want you to have an awesome Sunday. God bless you.